Jedi News interview, Mark Newbold interviews Stephen Stanton. Stephen, okay. welcome to Jedi News. Hi, Mark. Thanks. Glad to be here. Star Wars, it's been a part of popular culture for over three decades now. Do you consider yourself, yourself, to be a Star Wars fan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, prior to the release of Star Wars, there wasn't really a, a lot that you could go to see at the theater, you know, that was in that sort of either science fiction or fantasy monster genre. You know, you'd have the occasional, you know, Ray Harryhausen stop motion film that would come out, and then you'd have all the, what we used to have, uh, you know, these uh, television stations, they were called UFH, U, UHF stations, and they would be like, you know, buying old packages of monster movies from the 50s and 60s and I always felt a little kind of cheated that I never got to see any of these things at the theater so I was very excited when uh, when Star Wars came out because it was really the first of anything like that that I'd ever seen uh, on the big screen yeah I guess at the time uh, there, there wasn't an awful lot was there there, there was uh, the no. King Kong remake Planet of the Apes lots of monkey films <laughs> wasn't there so <laughs> Things like that. Most of the stuff, you know, I was kind of small, a little, and my parents, you know, they wouldn't let me go see things like yeah. that, you know. So, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't at the theater seeing any of those things. I'd have to wait for the cut down version to come on TV years later, yeah. you know. So, your role of, of Tarkin, which, which is the one that has kind of really pushed you to the forefront of, of, of our imagination as, as Star Wars fans. Obviously, you're succeeding the great Peter Cushing, who was a, who was a British national treasure and, and added great gravitas to that role. How did you break down Cushing's interpretation, his own interpretation of Moff Tarkin? How did you break that down to sort of recreate it? And what hooks were there for you as a voice actor to build upon? Well, you know, the first thing that you, you know, I had to look at was, you know, the scenes in uh, Star Wars A New Hope and, uh, you know, just kind of get a feel again for, you know, the whole characters, you know, just watching his sequences pretty much you know, in order. And then, uh, you know, sort of trying to, trying to figure out what that character would, uh, would be like or sound like, uh, several decades earlier, you know, Peter Cushing definitely has, uh, he definitely has a rhythm and a cadence to his voice that is very, uh, sustainable and that can be copied. But then I wanted to add on to that, you know, what Tarkin was like as a young man early on in his military career. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I did, you know, apart from looking at the, you know, the earlier films that he did for Hammer, which, you know, there's a lot of great stuff that he did yeah. there. You know, there's Baron von Frankenstein or Van Helsing in the, in the Dracula films. The thing that really caught my attention was uh, his, his, uh, his turn as Sherlock Holmes, either in the, the Hammer, or the, Hound of Bas the Hound of the Baskervilles, or the ones that I actually used as reference, which was the BBC television series, which had a lot of dialogue for it. Yeah. Because to me, the his portrayal of Holmes is that sort of like abrasive, very sure of himself, confident character that doesn't care what people think. That was kind of like the way I I kind of imagined Tarkin for myself. So I kind of used his performance as Sherlock Holmes as my starting point to kind of base the character that's on. That's an interesting. That's an interesting use of of his earlier earlier vo You know, his earlier characters to sort of bring something from there into that that well, yeah. role. Yeah. Well, because, you know, if you go back to like, you know, if you just go to the Frankenstein films, he's kind of like this sort of crazed, mad scientist, evil guy. And Van Helsing, he's, you know, he's, he's really a nice yeah. guy, you know. So I had to kind of find that sort of in between those two kinds of characters, you know. So was it daunting to succeed Peter Cushing in the role, knowing that like James Arnold Taylor, you were following in these, in terms of Star Wars, certainly, in uh, these iconic and famous footsteps that had been laid down before? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's one thing when you're doing a a, a new character on Clone Wars, uh, because then you're kind of you know you're you have a little bit of freedom. You know, you're you're working within the confines of the descriptions given to you by the director or the creators of the show. But here in this case, I mean, there was something that was already laid down that has become iconic. You know, so uh, you know, I was I was definitely nervous. You know, and uh, starting out the sessions, and I kind of had forgotten about it. You know, because we did these you know, months and months before they, they premiered. And I remember uh, the week and the week before that those episodes were going to premiere, um, Dave Filoni kind of reminded me, he goes, oh, you know, your episodes are coming up. <laughs> and I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, really important stuff here. And I'm yeah. like, oh, gosh, you know. And he's like, yeah, don't be nervous. <laughs> and it was, you know, you never know how things are going to be received when you have an, uh, a character that's like, 
as iconic as uh, Tarkin than it played by uh, an actor like Peter Cushing. Absolutely. So. And it's fascinating for us as well, because obviously we only got to see Cushing do it that one time in, in the original film. But the character mm-hmm. has, has, has kind of had a life in, in the EU, you know, the expanded universe. But also as, as fans, it's, it's just so nice to go back to a character that had such an impact in that first film and have yourself now have the chance to just open up the parameters of what Tarkin was and, and how it all worked. It's, it's great to see that. Yeah, and um, one of the great things about, um, pardon me, there's phone okay. going off in the background. Um, the, the great thing about doing, uh, doing the character now is that, you know, I'm getting to explore parts of the character that we don't really know about, you know, that we haven't, we haven't seen yet. It's not just like, oh, here, this is an extension of who he was as the commander of the Death Star. This is who he is uh, or who he was as a young man and how he got to be you know, in that place. I think there's still a lot of things that need to be filled in, but it was certainly uh, the Citadel trilogy was a lot of fun to work oh, yeah. on. And, you know, there was a lot of things that I thought that were revealed right there in the relationship between Tarkin and Anakin that were just wonderful. Yeah, well, I've got to say, personally, the, the, that Citadel trilogy was the highlight of season three for me. So I thought it was, uh, yeah, you, you certainly made a, a, a very, very good impact in that season and with the character, like you say. It's, well, me too, and you know, and I was glad to see it was a multi-story arc. Yes, you know, that was a lot of fun. Well, it gives you more scope, then, doesn't it, to sort of play the nuances mm. out? I guess. Do you do it in in chronological order when you're doing your your audio stuff? Is it done in the order as we see it on the screen, or is it done in in different ways? Uh, you mean as far as the the episodes? No, the, no. Like when do- you record an episode, uh, is it is it done in the order of as we see it on the screen? Do you record it in that order, or is it chopped around in different ways? Because I know when you're doing live oh, no, action, it's, it's all over the place, isn't it, sir? Right. No, since, since, you know, we don't really have locations that we're trying to shoot at, you know, we, uh, we pretty much start on page one of the script and then work our way through to the, to the cool. end, which I think is, you know, is, is really a great way to do it. It kind of keeps the flow going and, it's, you know, you don't get confused or have to remind yourself what you just yeah. did, you know, because you just did yeah. it. Well, at the moment, right now, your career seems focused on your vocal talents and the arena of voice acting. But what is it about that acting discipline, the voice, the voice work, that attracts you and what makes you such an effective voice actor, in your own opinion? Well, yes, you know, I, I, was, I was attracted to voice acting before I even knew what it was, I think. When I was a kid and I would sit in front of the television and, you know, imitate or mimic the, you know, the, uh, the cartoon voices I would hear on, like, the Looney Tunes uh, uh, cartoons or the Hanna Barbera Saturday morning cartoons that we used to have here in the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really wasn't even aware that this was a job or a career or anything. I just knew that the characters talked a certain way and I liked it and I tried to imitate it. And then I found out about people like, you know, Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler. And it was like, wow, really? You, you can, there are people that do that for, for a living. <laughs> that's, that's a job. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, kind of a thing to look at and you know it just kind of escalated from there I went to film school and you know was always looking for a chance to either narrate somebody's film or do some ADR or anybody that had a cartoon character that they were doing you know I was always volunteering to do voices I you know uh, we used to have a uh, there's a very there's a very classic uh, exercise in film school at least in the United States it's it's in, in our in an editing class where they give you scenes from the old American western television series Gunsmoke oh, yeah. You're given the raw footage, and you're supposed to assemble it in however way that you see fit. And, of course, uh, myself and in, in my group, when we did it, of course, we took all the original voices out and, of course, substituted them with all the crazy voices that I wanted to do, you know, like James Arness sounding like Elmer Fudd, you know, <laughs> Marshall Dillon, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, I've had a long history of, of, of playing around with it before I actually started doing it uh, for a living. And then, you know, I think all of that has come into, into play. I think, you know, one of the things, uh, in particular, if you're doing, going to be doing voice matching or, uh, animation, uh, voiceover work, I think practice is a huge part yeah. of, uh, what helps, uh, bring you success in that arena, a love for the thing, of course, but I think practice, and of course I've had years of practice. So there you go. Excellent. Well, I guess, I guess always you've, you've got to be listening and especially when new voices new people come onto the scene it, you know in in showbiz i guess as a voice actor you're going to be listening to somebody who's got a unique voice and thinking what's the hook how do i emulate that what what makes that guy's voice or however work I, exactly yeah. i mean i have an ipod that is like 90 percent uh 
<laughs> celebrity voice clips <laughs> and I think 10% singing. And then of the percentage that's of music, part of it is singing stuff that I have to match. So. All right. Do you sing a bit? A little bit. I, whenever I go into a lot of the animation, especially if you, I do a lot of work for Disney, yeah. and uh, I don't, it's very difficult to do a Disney film with it without doing some singing. So True. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. The process of recording, it appears to be different every time we speak to a different actor. In recording your talking episodes, did you record in a room, as we've seen photographs sometimes with the rest of the cast, or was yours done in isolation? I know Anthony Daniels does his over here in London, and so obviously geographically it, it has to be separate, but, but is yours done with everybody else? Yeah, it, it, um, every, I've been fortunate. Every episode that I've done for The Clone Wars has been with the... Uh, a, you know, a pretty full cast. So, you know, and sometimes the cast is three people and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, like it was recently, uh, nine people right. were in the room you know, and everybody was doing multiple voices. So it gets to be very lively sometimes, but yes, uh, in particular, the three Tarkin, uh, episodes I did, uh, I did with the cast. 